like you would use this. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to do uh, a visual tour of sustainability and resiliency. I'm, I'm really interested in trying to get everyone in the room to not only realize that architecture and landscape architecture and urbanism play a huge role in solving uh, the, the challenges of climate change and ensuring a, a more shared and equitable quality of life through sustainable design. So I really want to give you the overview. Um, let me start with the definition of resiliency. I have been uh, privileged to work with Burke Gregory, one of the principals of Mifun, and Alistair McGregor, one of the principals of Ovid Arab, on a, a crowdsourced identification of what we have to do differently if we're serious about climate change. And this is important to realize we're dealing with two factors, chronic stresses, uh, which essentially weaken the fabric of the city and acute shocks, which are sudden and sharp events. So let's just talk about them. So what could possibly be wrong? <laughs> right? Water resilience is both, in this case, significant deluge rains, which uh, is beginning to happen in California, surprise, surprise, and certainly is happening throughout uh, parts of the Gulf region and, and, and Florida. And it's important to realize that these hurricanes completely devastate often the most, the poorest uh, parts of society. Over 180,000 homes were damaged in this Hurricane Harvey, and only 20% of those homes actually had flood insurance. So people are really left vulnerable by deluge. The antithesis is watershed design, uh, design for absorption, flood, flood resistant design. The other end of the water story that could go wrong is drought. And I think you feel both of those, damage and drought. And we have significant challenges. Uh, there, there are at this point 10 watersheds that are completely severely stressed, including watersheds of the neighboring states to California, thanks to California, um, and, and Mexico and other places. And the antithesis of that is designing for deep water conservation, designing for district uh, water capture storage, gray water utilization. I mean, there's so much design opportunity for us as professionals. The third challenge of water is contamination. So we're looking at three different aspects of water alone. And we've got significant uh, conditions where we've got over 63 million Americans that are exposed to unsafe drinking water, Flint, Michigan still has not solved their contaminated water problem. They're still living with bottled water. Um, and at this point, we could, we could design a, a whole different solution, which is separation of potable and non-potable water infrastructures and design for access and maintenance to fresh water. Um, what we did with the crowdsourcing is we actually began to generate design guidelines. And I'm not gonna read these to you. I, uh, we will share this PowerPoint with all of you, you can use it at will, and I'll give you a chance to look at what we think are some of the design solutions. Um, what I'd rather do is show you some of the design solutions so that you're inspired to want to be part of the solution, us, uh, the, the, the uh, design community that's doing that. This is Fitz Conservatory. Uh, it is a, a living building. It is a lead platinum and a well platinum and a pre-am platinum, and it literally has hit the sustainable sites, every major standard, it said, we're gonna to go to the top. And it's a living building challenge, which means that it is a net zero water, it lives on its own water footprint. Now it is a greenhouse. So it basically is using huge greenhouse roofs to capture water. And then they clean the water and use it as gray water for all the landscape needs. And then they take the gray water from the toilets and which becomes black water and they process that. And they use landscape to process the black water to turn it back into gray water and they close the loop on the entire water system and make one of the most beautiful destinations that happens to be in Pittsburgh, about two blocks from Carnegie Mellon's campus. We're very privileged that the executive director of FIPS has been fighting for living building solutions. Okay, energy, another major resilience challenge. What could possibly go wrong? I mean, including the, the gas pipelines that leak on indigenous properties, um, and the question about whether we should be continuing to pipe gas from tar sands, which is another indigenous uh, land hole that's been completely compromised by our insatiable demand for fossil fuels. Um, the challenge is that we have energy insecurity and we have energy waste. We have 
a significant number of people who are still in crisis mode every summer because they don't have access to air conditioning. So people have to leave their apartments in, in poor neighborhoods and find a place to be in safe refuge. And there's significant increases in the number of, of, of deaths, not just in the US, but, but around the world because of global warming. We also have a reliability and a grid failure problem where we, we essentially have more and more power outages every year and more people that are being left uh, stranded uh, for sometimes days, if not weeks at a time. Um, and you see that in, in, uh, in this region where you start to realize that the actual reservoirs that we rely on for power are drying up. And for us to continue to use power at the peak level that we, and we're going to grow because now we're electrifying everything. So our power demands are going to go up, and yet we have not figured out how to save enough to make our existing infrastructures be able to support. So again, there are sort of rules that you could follow. You could say, okay, we're going to basically put a limit for every architect on what their energy demand could be and their peak energy demand which is essentially what passive house standards are doing. They're just saying you cannot use more than this amount of energy for heating, cooling, and blood loads in a building, and you can't use more than this peak because we know you can provide the same quality of life at a much lower level. Like a third of the demand can be uh, provide you with the same quality of life. So why aren't we doing that as professionals? Again, I'd like to show you some examples. This is where I live and work. This is where Junho did his PhD. We are a living laboratory for high performance buildings. It is a completely daylit. The power went off at Carnegie Mellon's campus and none of us knew it went off. We, we were literally working away on our laptops which have about an eight or 10 hour battery on them. We were daylit, we don't have electric lights on during the day. We're just sort of working away and people are streaming out of every building on campus. And we're going, what, what's happening? Is there a party or is there a bomb threat? What's happening? It turns out the power had gone out on campus and we didn't know. That's resiliency, right? That's how you design. It's a wonderful place to work. We, we feel very privileged every day to go to work here and study here uh, and to do laboratory research. Food, another huge challenge on the resiliency. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, number one, we have food deserts. We have significant food insecurity and diet challenges. One in three children are obese by their fifth birthday. I mean, there's something wrong with our food systems, right? We know that. We need to basically rethink our food systems and access to healthier foods. So we need to be, as designers, designing food hubs, designing community gardens, designing local fishing. I mean, really rethinking what foods can we get to families in their own neighborhoods that would give them both security and healthy diets. We've got food toxicity problems. A lot of that is because we have a tendency to can and ship uh, foods and over long distances, and then we keep them often not in adequately um, uh, chilled environments. And so we've got some significant toxicity problems, which we, again, with local foods, we can design around. Um, and we have very substantial food waste issues. So as a designer, we really want to think through the food cycle. Where are we going to get it from? How far away do we have to go? Can we do things locally? And then how do we, in fact, engender a way to reduce the amount of waste? And if we do have waste, to turn it into fresh soil. Um, and again, we've, we've, we've used crowdsourcing. This is over three different AIA conventions and Greenville conventions. We use very smart people in the room to come up with what do we have to do differently? Well, we have to do urban growth boundaries to preserve local agricultural land. Instead of shipping everything from California, we should be able to at least get tomatoes from the Pittsburgh region in the summer. Um, we need to do uh, regional uh, uh, development right transfers in order to get, um, to allow for that agricultural land and allow developers to make a profit without having to, to buy uh, cheap agricultural uh, farms. And we need to support on site fresh fruit production and sales so that people can actually um, make a living at providing food. Again, just to inspire you, there are examples that are really quite beautiful. This is a campus um, that is part of Chatham University called Eden Hall. It was designed by Mathune and, and Berkeley's firm BNM, along with a whole team of engineers and, and uh, landscape architects, Andrew Kogan, one of the leading, and uh, CEC, one of the leading civil infrastructure firms, 
on a campus that is self-sufficient with its own food, water, and energy. It is a beautiful campus. It grows its own food. It actually offers degrees in, uh, in self-sufficiency. It offers degrees in, in uh, culinary degrees that work with food grown um, locally. They cycle you know, the waste from fish um, growing into uh, fertilizer for the landscape. And of course, they have a big PV array to provide for the power needed for all of that. If you go out there, you can, you can have lunch. Uh, it's a fantastic locally grown and fish food production campus that is a real inspiration for what one can do if you design around food. Waste, another major crisis that we, we've got to design around. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, number one, we've got significant toxic waste. And you know, I, I'm as guilty as everyone, I'm sure, in this room, the number of times that we've upgraded our laptops, our, our, our smartphones, our te the technologies we rely on, because we're sort of, for they're forced into obsolescence. Now, other industries are being told you're not allowed to throw it away. You have to take it all back. But right now, the, the technology that we buy for homes the industries who sell at that should be, be forced to take them all back. And we should be designing uh, for cradle to cradle, and I'll come back to that. We also have another waste problem, which is poor sanitation. And the antithesis of this is great design for stormwater capture. Part of the reason we have storm sewer crises is because of, of deluge rain overflowing our sewage systems with stormwater. And it backs it up into the rivers. And we literally have created a crisis because we, we the design community, have not figured out how to take stormwater out of, the, out of the storm sewer. We should be taking stormwater directly into the landscape, into cisterns, into infrastructures that allow it to trickle its way back into the water table to keep our water table healthy. We should be capturing water as a precious commodity, not dumping it into the sewage system where it causes these poor sanitation. Um, and another issue of waste is that we have raw materials that are very rare in a lot of the, the technologies. So we're, we're, we're actually in a crisis trying to find all the materials that make for good laptops. Oh, I saw on the paper today that they found some, some reserves, but we're literally extracting from the earth stuff at a rate that the earth can't reproduce it. So the question is, can we design cradle to cradle so the resources go back. So here's an inspiring project in Stockholm, Sweden, where the entire community is about waste collection. And you, you, all through the neighborhood are these kinds of waste drop locations. The kids are so well trained in their schools to separate everything. They take care of the waste and then the waste goes back to a central heat system. Oh, maybe I don't have a second photograph. Let's see. Here's, I'm not gonna read again this to you. You, you can look at it later. So this is Hammerby in Stockholm. Uh, they have a, a, a vacuum system under the earth. So the infrastructure was designed for taking waste back to a general waste to energy plant. Sweden is using waste as their energy fuel. And this is really powerful because we're, instead of extracting fossil fuels, they're taking commodities, but you have to separate out the toxicity which means you need a responsible citizenry and a good infrastructure that allows you to separate it out. And in addition to taking out the toxicity, they take out every commodity that has a new life. So glass and aluminum and paper, boy, it has more lives to go. So it really becomes the last element of waste that becomes the fuel source for heating. And this entire community of 10,000 homes is heated by waste heat from a power plant which is a waste to fuel energy power. All the energy is, all the heat energy is free because it's, it's waste. It would have normally gone up the stack of the power plant. It's now being recaptured and looped in a very shallow infrastructure. And it is a beautiful community. When I went to Stockholm, I Airbnb to stay in this community because I wanted to experience what it was like to be in, in a community that essentially has no waste. Mobility, we're almost at the last few of the, of the resiliency crisis. We are an impoverished nation because we only have one way to get places and that's cars. We have not created a portfolio of solutions. We don't have light rail, high-speed rail, 
biking, walking, all the things that a really robust city has, we basically cut them off and we said, okay, if you want to get someplace, get in your car, we'll give you parking garages. So this is what happens in a hurricane. This is 6.4 million people trying to leave Florida during Hurricane Irma with only one means of, of egress. The only way out was a car in a complete you know, parking lot. No way to get out of the state, right? This is not a future in design. So ultimately we've got to right, start thinking about every form of transit as if it's a design option and make it integral. And I can certainly see it in, in Los Angeles. There's a lot of work going on for bike lanes. I mean, I see it happening. Um, and it's really important that every design uh, faculty and every design student in this room be part of the answer, right? You should be designing for this. Um, we've got inactive lifestyles because of the car. Kids can no longer walk to the library or walk to the ball field um, or even walk to school, right? So we've ultimately uh, put these kids in a condition where the only way they can get to the places they need to get to is to get into a car, which means they're inactive. And in this case, you can see that most kids spend five to seven hours a day on TVs or computer screens. This is not exactly the future we should be designing. We also have a percentage of the population, about 25% of Americans are either too young, too old, or infirm and cannot, or poor, and cannot drive themselves places, right? So they're essentially landlocked. They can't get to the places that those of us with cars can get to. So we need to start rethinking our design guidelines for mobility. Another inspiring example for mobility is Vauban in, in uh, southern, uh, in Freiburg, Germany. This is a neighborhood designed about around mobility. It's designed around kids. And they literally have removed the cars. There is a major, you can drive in to drop off groceries and grandma, but you then have to drive to a parking garage and you leave your car in the garage and you walk. The kids own the streets. It is the highest density of children in all of Germany because when families found out about this neighborhood, they moved to Freiburg. And now it's, it's an incredibly, it has huge biodiversity because most of the, lands, of the area is landscaped and not, not hardscaped. So the red road is the actual driving road. The green uh, roads are, uh, are only um, pedestrian and the yellow roads are dropping off groceries. And it's just an amazing uh, neighborhood in, in Freiburg that is all around mobility and the highest concentration of children. Human health and safety, what could go wrong? Well, we've got significant natural disasters. So we're, we're all trying to learn to design for hurricanes, floods, cyclones, earthquakes, right? But how do we design for this? Um, we've got some major problems with sealed buildings. So in, in Hurricane Katrina, uh, people in hospitals in a sealed building the mechanical system was off for weeks. What do you do with senior patients in beds in hospitals where there's no air being delivered and it's hot outside? You have to relocate all of them, right? And there aren't enough locations to relocate them. We should not be sealing our buildings. It is not a resilient solution. Even in hot climates, we shouldn't be sealing our buildings because survival was possible if you, if you could open a window. It's not possible if you have no windows that open. We also have a significant pollution challenge contributed to a lot by cars and power plants, both of which we're trying to replace. And um, we have a health, an access to health care uh, crisis in rural America because we've been closing hospitals and Planned Parenthood clinics and everything we can close because we don't want to support the, the social safety net. And so all of a sudden people don't have access to the health care they need. So we have to design for mobility, resilience, and uh, human health. Um, I love this example of a walking school bus. This is in Korea, uh, where instead of having kids get in a school bus, they've made a decision as, as a series of parents to take all the kids as if they were a little school bus on the sidewalks to school, even though it's a 45 minute walk, and they pick up kids along the way, the same route the bus would take except it's now the walking school bus and parents volunteered the 
the leader of the walking school bus every day of the week and get their kids back into physical shape. Examples of buildings that are really designed about human health, the Omega Center, which is in upstate New York, is a waste treatment plant that is a yoga destination. Now imagine, think about it, a very different idea about waste treatment, right? It's no longer the stinky, horrible place that you just create some factory way out in some abandoned uh, you know, gravel parking lot. It's now all of a sudden becomes the yoga center for a community because we know how to manage waste better. Um, the well building standard is certainly raising the bar for us to understand how to design for human health. It recognizes that every one of our uh, human health systems, the circulatory system, our respiratory system, our digestive system is impacted by buildings. So they've written examples and found the evidence to argue for why we need to do better design for respiratory and the digestive and the musculoskeletal and each of the systems. Yeah. So the last one is ecological health. And um, this is actually a, a bee, a, um, a beehive that formed on my in my front porch behind a panel. They found a way behind the panel and built this entire hive. And I kept watching all these bees come and go. And I thought, wow, I've got a lot of bees all of a sudden. So I finally got a specialist to come and take the whole hive with the queen, um, hopefully successfully, um, so that I didn't have to live with the bees right there. But uh, it was amazing how productive those bees are. But we do have a crisis. We have not only a global warming crisis and a resource depletion crisis, but we have a biodiversity and a bee crisis. So we all of a sudden need to start designing for bees. We need to find a way to actually make our landscape and our civil infrastructures be continuous biodiversity corridors for bees and, and pollinators and insects and, and animals. And again, we have guidelines that we've written for those. Uh, beautiful examples of, of design firms that have gone back and rebuilt the biodiverse landscapes that are necessary to keep our coastal uh, conditions in high uh, flooded conditions, to keep them intact, to allow them to be uh, places for, for survival for um, diverse populations. It's, it's really beautiful to see what's, what's emerging uh, in coastal design for biodiversity and ecological. So one of the things we're gonna to have to do for the ecology is we're gonna to have to stop extracting so many raw materials. And Cradle to Cradle and Upcycle, two books by McDonough and Browngard are pretty much the lead, leading ideas for what we have to do to minimize what we use in design of both architecture and interiors um, and landscapes uh, we, and, and civil infrastructures, we really have to basically make sure that everything we use either goes back into a biological cycle, so it becomes fertilizer, or it goes back into an industrial cycle so that my iPhone becomes part of the next iPhone, right? Because when, when something fails in here, everything else is still fine. But the piece that failed through made the whole thing become waste. So the idea is to eliminate waste just the way nature has no waste. So we start to design, it's, it's really um, transformative and it's definitely changed industry. It hasn't yet changed architectural practice as far as it could. So what I've been talking about is not just the side of resiliency that is protection from all those bad things that I've listed of, you know, of uh, climate change and natural disasters and pollution and materials, it's also to ensure access to all the good things. How do we get fresh water? How do we get food? How do we get better air? How do we get tolerable temperatures, if not delightful temperatures? How do we get light and sanitation and a sense of community and access to electricity and mobility? We need to design for a net zero or even a net positive world. So we're actually regenerating um, conditions that we had degraded professionally as designers. So one of the terms I want to sort of leave with you guys as I give you uh, the last set of examples is something I call environmental surfing. Environmental surfing means that we don't give up air conditioning because I know everybody in this room will say, no, I've got to have air conditioning. Although I tell you, LA, you could probably live without air conditioning. But anyway, uh, there are a lot of places in the world that will say, no, no, we have to have air conditioning. But what we've done is we've actually said, we have to have air conditioning all the time. We've sealed our building 
And if you're not air conditioning, you're heating or you're blowing air, you're literally, you've put people in a spaceship that is not sustainable. So what we have to do is we have to surf naturally as long as we can. So as many beautiful days as LA has, you don't use air conditioning or air or anything, right? You use nature as your natural conditioning. And it's only when it's too hot that you start to, to flip it over. And that's where low tech and high tech come together. So let me give you some examples. So in a net zero economy, architecture will celebrate the climate it's in, the culture and the region. So my environmental surfing in Pittsburgh is very different than your environmental surfing in LA or someone in Phoenix or someone in Boston, right? We have very different climate and culture and regional conditions. It'll balance deep conservation. So I don't need electric light for long periods. This could be a daylight lecture room, by the way. It doesn't have to be, all, this one isn't. Well, it originally was, but it's certainly not now. So there's nothing you could do if the power went out. Um, you'd have to leave, right? Um, and we're doing a dynamic embrace of natural conditioning. What that means is we're getting rid of the, what I consider a static dark glass facade sealed building. They have to go. Dark glass says the sun is evil. The sun is not evil. The sun is our daylight source. The sun is our heat source. The sun is wonderful. It's just evil when it's really hot, right? So we need to, we need these buildings that bristle when it's hot, that all of a sudden all the device, shading devices roll out. And you know it's hot because the building comes alive and all the shading devices roll out, right? It's like a flower. It says, it's hot, shade, right? We need to design dynamically, not statically. These buildings are, by definition, lock in a chemical soup of materials, and optimum activities with serious consequences for human health, i.e. COVID, right? This is why we spent all of the COVID cycle eating outdoors, because this was not a good space for COVID. Um, but it also has other impacts like asthma, skin and eye irritation, reproductive health um, loss, cancer. All these things are bad. We really don't want to design steel buildings anymore and dark glass buildings because they're basically locking out natural conditioning or environmental surfing, as I like to call it. Um, deep buildings with windowless workspaces lock out all the natural conditioning possibility of passive solar heat, of daylight, of natural ventilation, of passive cooling, and nature is renewables. Nature is, renews it every day, uh, which is the centerpiece of human health and environmental resiliency. So we need to design for environmental surfing. This is back in Hammerby. It maximizes natural conditioning, unique to each climate, uses less energy, less water resources. It maximizes local materials, and it uses less transportation, and it reduces technological complexity with just in time, just where needed, technological innovation. So therein lies what the engineers need to start designing to match the environmental surfing architecture uh, is technology that is just in time just as needed and innovative. So here's what some of that looks like. So you, you surf for free heat from the sun as long as you can. This is the um, um, incredible solar uh, heated, um, gosh, I'm gonna get a bath. I'm gonna draw a blank here, sorry. Um, it'll, it'll achieve about 75 to 90% of your, of your heating needs. Um, this is a home that's passively heated Again, it will achieve a lot of your heating needs. Uh, here's some work by Junko Choi, where he looks at does solar heat matter to the health of patients in hospitals? And he found that in fact, uh, the average length of stay in hospital patients, in gynecology patients in bright sunlit, sunlit rooms was 41% shorter than ones who are not in sunlit rooms. So it absolutely impacts your healing in hospitals. So sunshine is magical. Please don't lock it out with dark glass, right? Uh, this is the library, Cambridge Library in Boston, uh, one of the most lovely solar heated, and it's a destination for people because they love to sit in these chairs, comfortable chairs in the sun on a cold day in Boston, reading books and, and being part of it. We need to environmentally surf for light. We should not be using electric light. We should be using daylight as long as we can. On the left is a Baroque church that predates electric lighting. Lo and behold, architects knew for generations how to design beautifully daylit spaces with very small apertures because they didn't have very large fields of glass. 
And on the right is a, a chapel by Saarinen at MIT. I, I lived right across from this chapel. And they, just a single skylight on the altar is transformative. I mean, daylight is transformative. Designing around daylight is just um, so creative and so beautiful. We shouldn't be designing around electric light. We do electric light innovation just in time, just when needed, right? Don't, don't blast everything with electric light, even though LEDs are a hell of a lot more efficient than the old incandescence and fluorescence. It doesn't mean we should blow millions of, of watts out during the daytime. Uh, samples of daylight classrooms. This is an Oculus by Charlie Brown one of the leaders in building science uh, at University of Oregon. And this is actually a dynamic wood element that actually gets tighter when it's hot and looser when it's, when it's cold. It lets more sun in and more light in. And it just takes that light and turns it onto the ceiling and gives you beautiful light. It could do so much beauty out of light. Again, I'm not gonna read these. Uh, I'd love you to look at some of the research that argues for why we need daylight because it actually triggers your sleep cycles. Early morning light, helps you fall asleep at night. And it needs to be daylight. And yes, we could try to simulate daylight with LED that has the same spectral quality, but why? Daylight's there, it's offering you the right spectral distribution, take it, right? Um, uh, airport on the left, which has been demolished, an airport on the right by Cesar Pelli, in which daylight is the dominant light source. All the other electric lights, except for the mandatory emergency lights are off at National Airport. So, you know, you can do so much with daylight design. One in Paris, again, daylight, an amazing um, uh, terminal at Orly. Um, and then I wanna talk about fresh air and natural cooling. I mean, I'm surfing for everything nature has to offer. To, and then I'm gonna add the technology to make it, make it smart. So this is a question of how do I get natural ventilation in your building? On the left, you have obviously have your classic aqua windows. Even better is to have the whole wall disappear so you're literally sitting outside when you're inside. On the right is Gaudí's Barcelona um, uh, Sagrada Familia. When you look at, at uh, Gaudí's church, you can't air condition a church of that scale. It's huge. And it has you know 8,000 visitors a day that come and go. And so ultimately, they, they pre-cool all that mass and he designed it to increase the surface exposure of the mass. And with oculi that take the exhaust out. So all night long, all of that concrete gets colder and colder and colder. And all day long, it absorbs the heat from the people. And it allows you to be comfortable in a church without central air conditioning. Natural ventilation can displace probably 20 to 40% of today's cooling and 70% of our breathing needs. And there's good research to justify natural ventilation for human health. Again, I won't talk about it. Lots of buildings designed for natural ventilation. This is school in, in Germany. Um, this, one of my favorite uh, convention centers in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, where most of the spaces are open air. The only spaces that are air conditioned at this convention center are the actual uh, conference spaces themselves. As soon as you leave the conference space, you have breaks, you get coffee, you get, uh, you get water or lunch, you open, you're in open air spaces and it's just spectacular. All day lit, all naturally ventilated, protected of course from the rain and from the sun, um, but basically outdoor living. Shopping malls that are not mechanically cooled, right? I mean, this is the Galleria in Milan, still one of the most iconic shopping centers in the world. It is not air conditioned, right? It is open air. It's covered from the rain. Uh, meanwhile, the one on the left in Denver is long, long been torn away, torn down. So it's really important for us to uh, design for natural ventilation. Surf nature as your primary uh, ventilation source. Shade, um, nature has a lot to teach us about shading, but of course, modern technologies can, can make a difference as well. So um, Oak Alley in, in uh, the Southeast is, is famous for how much cooler it is than all the rest of, of uh, its surrounding. And we, we really have to treat trees as precious um, resources. Um, and then we need to increase the outside air, provide shade canopies. Um, and 
a lot of the research uh, I put on these slides for you to look at at a future time. So I want you to increase your outside air, add task air. So we want the mechanical systems to be innovative, turned on when you need it. Let's you know, open the windows and then find a way to add air conditioning. Eliminate outcasting from all of our furniture. Give back temperature control. Let nature provide as much comfort as it can and then give people control. And uh, Jun Ho's PhD dissertation was letting biosignals, letting your wrist, your smartwatch become your, your controller. So it would know when your wrist got too cold and turn on the heat, or it would know when your wrist got too warm and turn on the air conditioning. And that's just in time delivery of mechanical conditioning where you would rely on nature as long as possible and then you, and then you switch up with, it, with advanced technology. Uh, make daylight dominant, turn on the electric light only as needed, where needed, and turn it off again. Now, at this point, my lights in my office are geofenced on my iPhone. So when I leave the office and take my iPhone with me, all the lights and everything that's, that's uh, on a smart plug will turn off, right? So it's very easy to say, okay, I don't need, I don't need high tech, expensive um, uh, energy demanding technologies. I can just let it, let it turn off automatically. Do separate ambient task light. We over light and you'll see it even still today in LA office buildings, dark glass, sealed buildings. Every floor has got a huge array of lights. And right now the occupant density is like 20% of, but they have to turn on the whole floor because there are not enough switches. They literally have designed it with just a few switches. And so the whole floor is on because three people went to work. And ultimately, smart technology, and this is where the Internet of Things is changing things, every light source is its own IP address. And you can basically re-engineer it to lower the light level. So you do a much lower ambient light, and only where people are sitting do you put up a high level of light, right? So we have the potential to separate low-level ambient, you know, less than 200 lux, and then have 500 or more lux if you need it to do fine print work. Uh, only where needed when needed. Maximize your views, but even more important, celebrate sunshine, celebrate shade, make every building bristle, and ideally make it bristle dynamically when needed. And I know there's a huge pushback on this. It, it always gets value engineered in our projects. You have to make it part of the iconic state. People don't take away the icon of architecture. If you have a projected conference room that's literally hanging 200 feet over open air, someone's paying for a huge structural frame to hold up that 200 feet of projection. It doesn't get struck out of the project, but the shading devices got struck out of the project. Make the shading devices your iconic statement, not the projected 200 foot conference space. It's not doing much for anybody. Really. Um, Remember to shade public spaces as well, make them dynamic. So this is, both of these are shades that can open and close, right? They can change the amount of shade on the street, the Sony Center in Berlin, the downtown Kyoto photograph. Um, I mean, definitely discover shading, especially in a climate like this and ensure access to nature. Um, if you haven't heard of biophilia, you wanna read the work of E.O. Wilson and Stephen Kellert. Uh, they have absolutely been trying to convince the design professions, the landscapers, the um, uh, horticulturalists, the civil infrastructure, and the architects that the future is in bringing nature back into the building and bringing the building back into nature. And it, it has a whole series of benefits of improved views and daylight and solar heat and natural ventilation. It's just, it's transformative as a design uh, approach and it does support the environmental surfing I'm trying to, to leave you with. Um, so the very last four slides, I think, are to celebrate outdoor living, working, and learning. See if you can design less internal space. Somebody commissions you to build a 10,000 square foot home, you probably should say no because it's excessive and not, uh, but you could say, well, what if I design you a 3,000 square foot home with 7,000 square foot of living space that is integral with the landscape, right? That is not conditioned. 
So you retreat to the 3,000 square feet when it's really hot or really cold or really windy or stormy. And you, you, you instead of designing 10,000 square feet of conditioned indoor sealed mostly space. Uh, one of my favorite projects of, of thinking this way is designed by uh, the firm in, in San Antonio, Texas, called Lake Flato. And they have basically taken uh, a series of old sheds. They had a client, two uh, curators from the university, or from the uh, museum in San Antonio, built a summer um, residence and meeting space. They took old sheds down that were abandoned relocated the three sheds. One of the sheds is the dorm for when they have conferences. One of the sheds has a micro house in it that's, that can be cooled and heated, and a macro conference space that's not conditioned. And the last shed is the shade for the outdoor pool. It is a beautiful project, and I've had the privilege of being in a retreat in this space where there were like 60 of us um, literally working on brainstorming, what's the future of architectural practice? And it's so inspiring to watch, to be part of nature, to watch the light change, to have the breezes. It's screened because there are a lot of bugs in, in central Texas, um, but it's, and it, and it's, it's shielded from heavy rains. It did rain for a, a couple of hours during our, and also the sun came out. I mean, it was just spectacular. And you retreat if you have to retreat, but you literally have most of your uh, space is not thermally conditioned and is environmentally surfing for comfort. So the living building challenge is probably the biggest reach in the American context. This is, or in the world context. They're literally saying we need net zero energy, net zero water, net zero land, meaning you cannot build anything on a new green field. All future architecture has to be on existing infrastructure because we have underutilized infrastructure. Don't take a design project for those of your faculty that's out in a green field. Take a design project on an existing brownfield, something that is built on the floor, because that is our future. We need to learn to build on our own footprint. We've already consumed more than we ever need to consume. And it, and it looks at materials and all the things that I've talked about. Here's a living building. Uh, there's a wonderful video, Children's Museum in Louisiana. You should listen to the video. It's so inspiring. Um, a lot of outdoor learning. They've taken as much of the program outdoors as they can. It's a children's museum. A lot of other children's museums put everything indoors. That's not good for the kids. It's not good for learning. Uh, and uh, this one's really spectacular. And this is uh, a living building at Georgia Tech. Uh, I wish our campus at Carnegie Mellon, and I hope your campus at uh, USC, builds a living building because it challenges the architects, the engineers, and the landscape architects to literally environmentally surf, to do just-in-time technology, and to create a resilient, doesn't matter if the power goes out, this is where you want to be. It has gray water, black water systems, it captures its own energy, it, it generates its own energy, captures its own water. This is where you want to be when, when Armageddon happens, right? So we should be building buildings that give people the refuge that, that we're hoping will have in the future. Thank you.